Much quoted verse in this day and age. 2 Chronicles 7, 14. Much quoted. All over the place. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and heal their land. I know most of you probably know it off by heart. If my people, my people, very specifically, if my people, and it's confirmed again, who are called by my name, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. Now that is a strong word. If my people called by my name will humble themselves, if they will pray, get down on their knees and pray and communicate with me, if they will seek my face, and if they will turn from their wicked ways. Sure. Called by my name, humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, which means repent, then... Only then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. You know, friends, that verse, as so often has been used, it's usually the verse we use for a prayer meeting or let's say a prayer day. Do you know it is so much more than that? It is so much more than that. And we need to hear it. We need to hear this from heaven. God isn't just calling us to a prayer day, a national prayer day, or an international prayer day. This is a call to consecration. It is a call to consecration. Maybe, don't quite understand what that word means, but it's a very, very strong word. God, all those things, you put all those things, that's more, that, that can't just be achieved in a day. That's a whole lot of things. Humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then, then I will hear then something will happen. But I seek consecration. And it's always been that way. We've changed it in the modern day and age. It's always been the way with God. He seeks consecrated lives. Because that is what it is. To be born again. is isn't just a hands up and a decision at a church. It's a consecrated life that produces fruit out of that consecration. You see, so many scriptures are like taken out of context. And we're very, very good at that in this day and age. Let's just look at the right context of this verse. Let's just look. You see, the Lord had appeared to Solomon. This was after Solomon had dedicated the temple. It was after that he had prayed a very, very long prayer. It was after fire had come down from heaven and consumed the sacrifice. The glory of the Lord had filled the temple. The priests could not enter. Such was the glory and the presence of the Lord. And the people had seen it all. They had bowed their faces to the ground. They had worshipped and they had praised the Lord. 
what a momentous occasion this had been. Almighty God had presenced himself that day. And it was the night after. It was that evening. And it was night after all this. And God spoke to Solomon. And he said to Solomon, he said this. He prefixed verse 14 with obviously verse 13. And he said, Solomon, listen. Listen to me. When I shut up heaven, when there's no rain, when I command locusts to devour the land, when I send pestilence amongst the people, when I shut up heaven, when there is no rain, when I command locusts to devour the land and I send pestilence amongst the people. Yes, Solomon, I do that. I am God Almighty, I do that. When are you going to understand? I do all those things. You see, I am God. I'm the God of love and I'm the God of grace and I'm the God of mercy, but I'm also the God of discipline and judgment and retribution. When are you going to hear that? I'm that all at the same time. You see, God is awesome. God is a jealous God and He is a consuming fire and we don't seem to want to come to grips with that. We'll hear all this stuff and we'll analyze all this stuff, but it's so much more. God is immutable. God is unchangeable. God is sovereign. And Solomon, when you understand that, if my people understand that, my eyes will be open, my ears attentive to their prayer. If they beseech if they come to me in sackcloth and ashes and in all humility, I, I will hear them. We remember Jonah. God had called Jonah and said, you must go to Nineveh. And he ran away. He didn't want to do the job. Got on a boat. Ended up hiding in the bottom of the, the boat. God brought a storm. We know the story eventually. Jonah, he owned up, the storm is because of me. They tried to save him, the people. The world always tries to save first. They started rowing against God. But anyway, finally, they realized that it wasn't going to help, so they threw him overboard. And God had got everything planned, as always, meticulous as ever, and there was a whale. And for three days and three nights, he was in the bosom of the whale, and go and read it. I'm not going to read it now, but in, in chapter 2 of Jonah, see what happened in those 10 verses. The simple bottom line, if you analyze it, he was taken right back to the basics, to the simple basics. Jonah was taken, this mighty man of God, this prophet, was taken to the simple basics again and reminded of it brought back to the reality of an awesome God, and then three days later, he was spewed out. He was spewed out, and he went into Nineveh, and he went and he preached the gospel. He preached the truth. And he didn't just have a meeting here and a meeting there. He preached to the whole of Nineveh. He preached from the king to the commoner, including the animals, the lot. And he preached... And he preached, and he preached the truth. And the response was repentance. From king to commoner, politician, clergyman, the lot. He preached to them all, and he preached the truth. He had been prepared for it because he had had an awesome experience in the belly of the whale. He had met again with God to be reminded of an awesome, awesome God, that he would preach it. Repentance is the only door to salvation 
It's the only door to mercy. It's the only door to forgiveness. It's the only door to regeneration. Back to 2 Chronicles 7, verse 19. Back to Solomon. You see, he had introduced verse 14. He just told them, if I do all these things. And then he concludes again, and he says this. This is Almighty God. In verse 19 he says, But if you turn away, if you forsake my statutes, if you serve other gods, I will uproot you. I will cast you out, and the people around will be astonished. Yes, they'll be astonished at what I did with my people. Why? Because they forsook me. And Solomon, I do that. And church, I do that. And modern world, I do that. Because I am an awesome God. Maybe you haven't read the Bible. Habakkuk. The greatest statement of faith. No figs, no grapes, no olives, no food, no sheep, no cattle, no nothing. Yet will I praise the Lord. A joy and a peace that's beyond the understanding of the world. He ends up at the end of Habakkuk. He makes that statement when he's, when he's come to grips with the absolute truth of Almighty God and the world we're living in. But it started again the same way. There he was. Lord, how long? How long must I call out? Look at all the violence and the injustice. Lord, why do you tolerate wrong? Destruction and violence is all around. Strife and conflict abounds. The law is paralyzed. Justice is perverted. The wicked hem in the righteous. Lord, can't you see? And there he is. He truly is a prophet. A genuine prophet. He's, there's an anguish. There's a divine anguish. Just like Jeremiah or Isaiah or any of them. The familiar rhetoric. His tears, heartache, anguish. The true prophetic voice crying out. And what did God say to him? He said, Habakkuk, you ain't seen nothing yet. You ain't seen nothing. He said, you are going to be utterly amazed. I'm going to blow your mind. I'm going to blow your theology. I'm going to raise the Babylonians. Yes, the Chaldeans and Nebuchadnezzar. Yes, and I'm going to raise them to be my ruthless, dreaded, self-indulgent, disrespectful agents for change. They deride kings. They scoff at rulers. Their only God is self. And Habakkuk was shocked and he was amazed. He was gobsmacked. It's all in the Bible. And God says again, write it down, it's going to happen. They will run for their very lives when they read it, says God. That's a promise. You see, it's about judgment. But he said, Lord, how can you speak like this? Your job is to look after us. Your job is to look after us. Sure, familiar rhetoric. You know, God has set principles into the system. They set as concrete into the system. God is not arbitrary. He doesn't selectively follow whims and fancies. There are no favorites. Backslid and Judah may be more righteous than the Chaldeans, but that doesn't matter. God deals with sin and rebellion. And then if you go and read it, and these authors in that small book, of Habakkuk. He says, Habakkuk, 
I want you to know and understand this because it's important for everyone. It's important today for the church to understand and for Christians to understand it. I have a problem with pride and arrogance and greed and lust and boozing and theft and extortion and animal cruelty and idolatry and lies and hypocrisy and corruption. Any form of unjust gain, murder and violence and sexual immorality and the shedding of innocent blood, I have a problem with it. Captivity and exile and banishment was all part of God's plan for His people. But we pick and choose. I mean, we, that, that's how we deal with Scripture. Much quoted Jeremiah 29. Line. It talks, I don't know how many times I've heard this where, where someone will say, I have plans for you and thoughts for you. Well, so let me just read it to you. Jeremiah says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and hope. And that verse is quoted out of context over and over and over again. And friends, I'm just showing this to you because that's what we're doing all the time. We're taking out of context a verse. This is how the verse actually works. From verse 8 it says, Thus says the Lord, this is Jeremiah speaking, the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are in your midst deceive you, nor listen to your dreams which you cause to be dreamed, for they prophesy falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them, says the Lord. For thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word towards you and cause you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me and I will listen to you and you will seek me and you'll find me when you search for me with all your heart. Sure, that's a bit different than the one verse that we've taken out of context. Same thing, the blessings and cursings in Deuteronomy 28. And the one that's really quoted is, you will be the head, not the tail. You'll be above and not beneath. Verse 13. Do you know what? Deuteronomy 28 has 68 verses. It has 68 verses. Verse 13 is that promise. The head, not the tail. Deuteronomy 28 deals with the blessings and the cursings. The first 14 verses are about the blessings. From verse 15 to verse 68, 53 of them God deals with the curses for disobedience. Let him who has an ear hear what God is saying. We all know the story of Job, but how many of us have read it verse by verse by verse? Because that's the only way you will get an idea of what Job went through. Not just a verse here and there. Stop feeding on choice snippets. Read the whole Bible, the whole gospel, the full gospel. You see, God has written these things into the system and they still apply today. And Jesus' death on the cross didn't cancel out the fact that sin, godlessness, and rebellion reaps consequences. Absolutely and utterly. And friends, we need to hear that and live that and preach that. Because that's the problem we have in this. Not one jot or tittle will pass from the law till all is fulfilled, said the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the one issue. The other one is this. 
Let's read Luke 18 from verses 9 to 14. Listen to this. And he, that's Jesus, spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. This is Jesus giving them a parable here. He said, he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like those other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I get tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. The Pharisee. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I'm blessed. I'm not like those pagans over there. I'm special. I'm predestined. I'm not of this world. I fast. I tithe. I minister. I'm loving. I'm caring. I do all those things. I've added a few there, but listen to all those eyes. So they're monstrous. All those eyes. The trinity of sin. I, me, and myself. And friends, hear me. Hear me. Sin. S-I-N. The I. The big I. P-R-I-D-E. I I in the middle. All the I's iniquity. We all have an ego problem. All of us. No exceptions. And if you've had any sort of fame or success, that ego becomes an ogre. I'm sorry. I define modesty as a relative ability some people have compared to others. Some hide their egos better than others, but we all have ego problems. I'm sorry, all of us. Sure. And those egos just get bigger in the church today. Do you know why? Because nobody's preaching against the ego, or nobody's preaching sin and repentance, and the ego monster just lives on. You know, I'm listening, and no, not all, but I'm listening to some modern preachers standing up in front and trying to convince the goats in his audience that they're sheep. Turn on your TV sets. You see it, not just on Sundays every day. Trying to convince the goats that they are sheep. And continuously trying to explain what God really meant to say when, he was, when he's being tough and judgmental. We take all that stuff modernly and we just shred them in the cheap grace shredder. (laughs) And then we wonder why. 
And friends, we need to hear it. We need to hear it. Because it's so easy to fit in there. You know, Jesus, Jesus upgraded the Ten Commandments. Do you know that? He didn't come and apologize for his father. You say, my, 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 you know, um, the father was a bit tough in the Old Testament. I've, I've come to make things a bit easier. I'm sorry. That's what's out there. Do not murder. That's the Ten Commandments. Sermon on the Mount says, don't even get angry. Sure. Adultery. Do not commit adultery. In the Sermon on the Mount, you can't even look. Do you know what we're doing? And listen to this. It's interesting to me. That in the book of Revelation, when they talk of the seven churches, in three of them they mention the synagogue of Satan. The synagogue of Satan, and many times I read about the synagogue of Satan, and I just thought those are the evil people in the church, until one day I actually read it properly. And it said, the synagogue of Satan are those who say they are believers, but they're not. Very interesting, that's a big problem. Those in the church who say they are believers, but they are not. The synagogue of Satan, very, very strong title, but then you start to get to understand. You start to get to understand that modern preachers are building that synagogue. They're building it. You build the synagogue of Satan when you're not preaching sin and repentance. The SOS, the synagogue of Satan, needs an SOS. Save our souls with the gospel. We actually need to preach the gospel because we are now teaching. We're teaching. We, we, we coach people how to speak fluent Christianese. Now we do. We know how to feel led have a burden, put things on the altar. We know all the right words and phrases and modern liturgies. We feel pretty good about ourselves and our maturity. Our old pride has taken over. Worse, it's now spiritual pride, the very worst of prides, the modern Pharisee, smooth, smiley, huggy, and sophisticated. We, we get mad, but we don't yell. We just avoid Snide remarks, subtle body language, a little slur or a slander, a fellowship gossip here and there. It's all there. I'm sorry. It's all there. The unbridled tongue, lashing and slashing away. We're being taught how to be Christians, and that doesn't happen. You can't be taught how to be a Christian. It's a natural function of the Holy Spirit and the Lordship of Jesus Christ in your life. But we get, uh, you know, the unbridled tongue, the right super spiritual cliches, all the right expressions, the right tone of voice, smile on the face. Maybe we smell or look like a rose, but inside there's a rubbish heap. Dry rot is set in the heart, and it's, but because the heart's still hot. There's, there, there's anger and resentment and envy and unbelief, unforgiveness, all neatly covered up. And we need to hear that. Like a cancer eating up the cells of your Christian walk. Subtle sin and mutiny masked in grace and freedom. Spiritually streetwise, but walking by sight and logic. Triumphalism, presumption, arrogance. The synagogue of Satan, biblical, 
and prophesied. Listen to this last word on the synagogue. We have matured beyond admonition and correction. We sit in the church and we have matured beyond admonition and correction. How dare you correct us? How dare you correct us? I've got an Afrikaans definition for it. I call it Ken Alice Christianity. Ken Alice Christianity. That's the Pharisee. Jesus had huge problems with the Pharisees. And what he said to the Pharisees, some of the things that he's quoted of saying, I mean, modernly, we would like to believe they were misquotes. Now we get the tax collector. He's standing far off. He didn't even feel that he was worthy to raise his eyes to heaven. He beat his breath. He beat his breast. An awesome God, oh, oh, mighty God, be merciful to me. I'm an unworthy sinner that I am. I'm a wretch. Like the prodigal son in the pigsty when finally the penny dropped. Or Peter on the boat, go away from me. I'm a wretched man. And Jesus sums it all up and he says, listen. And he said, listen, listen, church, listen. I tell you, said Jesus, he is the justified one. He is the saved one. He is the real testimony. He is the sheep, not the goat. He is the wheat, not the tear. He is the wise virgin. He who exalts himself will be humbled. He who exalts himself will be humbled. And friends, we don't want to hear that. We don't want to hear about being humbled because you can't humble yourself. Only the Holy Spirit, only that ministry, only God can bring you down. Humility is not a natural gifting that we have. The greatest shall be the servant of all. You know, we know the story of Job. And I, we've been dealing with it a few times at our, 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 our morning prayer sessions. And you know, everyone at the prayer session, they know about the Job story. But I ask them, how many of you have actually read through it, verse by verse, because, you know, Job was the most righteous guy. He was a testimony, such a testimony that God even boasted about him. He said to the devil, have you seen my servant? What a testimony. He said, and the devil says, of course he's got a testimony. You bless him out his socks. So let me take some of those socks away and we'll see a different guy. And God handed him over. And he lost a lot. And read every verse there to see what he lost. It was horrific. And then his three friends arrived. And they did their most powerful ministry for the first seven days when they kept quiet. And then they produced 30 chapters of advice. Recorded here and we're still using it every day. Busy analyzing what was going on. And you must read that verse for verse because that's the way we're going to get with the Bible. 
It's God's revelation. But we must read the Bible and, and read it slowly and read it out aloud to yourself. And eventually, all the counseling stops. And God, God intervenes. Now, you and I would probably, it would be fair to expect that maybe God owed an, at least an explanation or maybe even an apology to Job. Because Job was in trouble not for himself. It was a bold decision. But did God, he said, who are you? He said, what do you know? Were you there? He said, were you there in 38? 38 verse, uh, uh, chapter 38 verse 2, he says, who are you? Where were you? Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? And in chapter 43, Job answered the Lord, behold, I'm vile. I lay my hand over my mouth. No apologies, no explanation. But he presented himself. Almighty God presented himself. Chapter 42. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do everything and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. You asked who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me which I did not know. Listen, please, and let me speak. You said I will question you and you shall answer me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. I have heard of you, says Job, by the hearing of the ear. But now I see you. Now I see you. I'm not just reading that. I see you. Therefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust. And ashes. You know, whether it's Habakkuk or whether it's Jonah or where every verse in the, every chapter in the Bible says the same thing. I don't know how we have got to where we have got in this day and age. It's all so clearly illustrated for us. It's all so clearly set out for us. John the Baptist. God sent him. He's the, the herald. He was the herald for the Lord Jesus Christ. Prepared him out there, not in the world. No signs and wonders, no miracles. He prepared him. And there were two major issues with him. He said, I must decrease so that he can increase. I must decrease. He realized that. Because the Spirit was in him. And the tr Spirit truly in you puts you in that position. I must decrease. You don't have someone to tell you you need to decrease. The Spirit will do that. I must decrease, he said. And then he said, I can't even tie his shoelaces. And he didn't say that because that's a glib remark to make. He said that because he knew and he believed by the power of the Spirit in him that he can't even tie the Lord's shoelaces. That is the Almighty God we have. That's the Lord. Just after that little bit, he said, Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. Childlike and not childish. So, thus says the Lord. Thus challenges the Lord each and every one of us. 
Because we need to hear it and we need to receive it. We haven't matured beyond receiving this message. We need to get this message on a daily basis. Just to remind us to get back. Just to remind us. Habakkuk, you ain't seen nothing yet. Just to remind us that Jonah had to go into the, into the bosom of the whale. That Jonah had to be brought back to the simple basics. It's about Jesus and Jesus and Jesus. Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there is any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Psalm 19, 13, 4. Keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless, and I shall be innocent of a great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and I shall be innocent of a great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. An awesome, an awesome Awesome God, if my people, if my people, my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, humble themselves and pray night and day on their knees in the closet and seek my face with all their heart and soul and mind and strength, and turn from their wicked ways and repent, then I will hear from heaven. Then I will hear from heaven. The message, the prophetic message, is Always the same. The prophetic message is always the same.